Road joining us for this symposium. Michael Road's work uh, isn't just about theater, at least not to me. <laughs> it's about um, policy and community and discourse and um, Roberto mentioned the term deliberative democracy yesterday and I think it's very much about supporting deliberative democracy through theater. So I'm delighted to welcome Michael Road, Artistic Founder and Artistic Director of Sojourn Theater and the Center for Civic Practice. You can hold that. Hey, everyone. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, hi. Hi, camera. Hi. Uh, so I'm really happy to be here because it seems to me that really exciting and interesting things are happening uh, in this city, in these cities, uh, and on this campus. So it's, it's really nice to be with you. I, I feel like the first thing to find out, because I might have missed this yesterday, but I don't, I don't know if we've actually taken a, a moment to figure out who's in the room. So I'm really curious who's in the room. So the first thing I'd like to do is, um, I'd like to know, maybe we can just do a, uh, oh, yeah, wait a minute. This will give you a sense of how this is going to go. <laughs> That's how this is going to go. So I, I basically got some ideas, some stuff I want to show, some stuff I want to talk about, some things I want to invite you to talk about. We have a bunch of time together. Um, this is a terrible space for a workshoppy thing. So we're really going to do less of a workshop and more of like me talking for a while and then me asking you in small groups to sort of chat a little bit and then we'll reflect out and we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. Um, but who in this room, we're going to do like the self-defining thing. Who's self-defined currently in your life, among other things, you can put your hand up as many times as you want, as a student? Who are students in this room right now? Okay, great. Who self-defines in this room? And again, your hand goes as many times as you want. As a teacher, all right. Who self-defines as an artist? Okay, great. Who self-defines as an entrepreneur? Who will I? All right. All right. Who self-defines, and I'm just I'm making categories up, right? Who self-defines, among other things, as an administrator? For whom is that a part of your, all right? Who self-defines uh, as a, um, I'm going to use the word, it's an awful word, the word wonk. Meaning like you're super interested in policy and civic things. Like that's interesting and juicy to you. There are some wonks in the room. All right. All right. Uh, who self-defines as a community worker? Whatever that means to you. Who self-defines as an activist? All right. Now I need you to help me. Help me with a couple other categories that would be for you related to why you're in this room today. So I... I for instance, like Emma, I'm, I'm a father, which of course in the larger sense is related to like why I am wherever I am these days, but in this moment is not necessarily the category that is related to what brought me to this room, perhaps karmically, but, but I don't know. So I want to know like in what ways would you sort of self-define that are related to why you're here now that I have not hit? Dramaturg. Dramaturg. Hands up if you self-define as a dramaturg. You get to a big point of mine where you're going to hear me talk about dramaturgy broadly later. Awesome. Uh, other categories. <coughs> Great parent. Who would say parent is a part of the, yes, great, great. Who, what else? What else What else sort of encompasses a part of your life? Yes. Researcher. Researcher. Hand up if you're a researcher. If you don't think you're a researcher, Laura, we have to talk about these categories. Because <laughs> that is, you don't know what you're doing then because you're doing a lot of research and you're sharing it. So, so that's a researcher right there. What else? How else would you self-define? I will call no one else out like that, I promise. How else would you self-define in this room? Yes? Arts activist. Arts, arts activist. Hands up. Again, as many times as you want. All right. All right. Others? Any others? Yeah? New work, new work generator. Hands up. New work generator. What about new practices generator? Ooh, that sounded sexy. Didn't it? Right. <laughs> yes, new practices generator. Good. All right. Um, okay, so no one said placemaker. Super interesting to me. I don't self-define as a placemaker. I have a lot of issues with the term, with a lot of this stuff, so that's, I'm excited to talk about that. Um, but nobody said that. Nobody said, I self-define as a placemaker and that's why I'm here. So I just note that. Interesting to me. Um, so 
we are going to do a little bit throughout our, our morning of like checking in with each other. And I'm thinking you are either sitting alone right now or amidst some people you know, which is lovely to be with people you know. But here's what I'd like to ask if you are willing. I would like to ask in this moment if you would be willing to help me remake the place that we're going to make together this morning in this space by standing and finding a person that you do not know and sitting in a chair next to them. So you are basically going to be a part of a pair for the morning. I will not make you do a lot of stuff together other than talk to each other, but I think it would be beneficial uh, if you found someone new to chat with this morning and you can refuse me by ignoring me. But if you, and come closer as you do that. It'd be nice to maybe be a little closer. So if you're in the back, which I respect, come closer. So you're moving around. Oh my gosh. Those of you watching at home, it's, it's chaos. It's chaos. Great. So you're finding a partner. Great. All right. Once you find them, sit with them, please. Find a partner. Just excited. Great. Look at that. It's nice. It's nice. All right. Finding someone. Yes. Yes. We're mixing. We're mixing. Oh my gosh. This is great. This is great. We're sitting down. Sonia, what we just did is we just, uh, we just found a partner. Maybe your partner's right there. All right. So now I'm going to bring your focus back this way, if I may. Bring your focus back this way. And the, the starting conversation's quiet. They quiet, it gets quieter. It gets quieter, it gets quieter. That's so nice, thank you. Uh, so two things, one, sitting in the back, that side or that side, I'm certain that we will have people wander in who didn't quite make the 10 a.m. So I will ask as we get started, if those of you sitting there or sitting there would tell folks when they come in that they're welcome to join us but that they should partner up with someone or join a trio rather than sit in the back alone. Because they'll need to be with someone to participate as we go forward. So you are on task and you are on task. That is awesome, thank you. You got it. Um, so the first thing, you might have already done this, um, but I just want to give you a moment formally to not only sort of say um, hello to your partner by name, but just I'm going to give you literally like 30 seconds of name, where you're from, I'll give you 60 seconds, where you're from and, and why you're here today, which might be, I took a class, I was told I had to come, end of story. <laughs> totally fine, totally fine. Might be somebody brought me here, that's why I'm here. Like whatever it is, 60 seconds, name where you're from, why you're here right now, I will interrupt you in 60 seconds, go. Plenty of time to um, plenty of time to talk with uh, with your partner over the next bit of time we're going to share together. I want to do one more group thing before we go forward. So I want to know um, if this is true for you. Just put your hand up. I'm going to do a couple statements, and if they're true for you, just put your hand up. Yeah. Um, I currently live in a place that is like the place I grew up. I currently live in a place that is like the place I grew up. Great. I currently live in a place that is quite different from the place I grew up. I currently live in the actual place where I grew up. Great. Okay. So just look around as we're doing this. Just get a sense of kind of the conversation, where people are coming from as we're having this conversation. Um, so I have moved around a lot. Yeah? I wish I had moved around more so far. 
I look forward to a lot of moving around in my future. Okay? I feel like I am currently in the place that feels like a place I want to be in for quite a while. I am aware that I am actively seeking the place that I will want to be in for a while. Okay? Okay. So, this is how this is going to go. <laughs> so, here's the thing about having a conversation about place and place making. Um, given a lot of pros, I want to make sure that also in the conversation is the notion that place is, um, well, I'll, 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 I'll put it this way. So, there's a camera right there that's feeding into a computer that's sending out a signal. So we're here together, right? But like I asked some company members of mine this morning to jump on and watch to be with us some, like especially right now, right? So these are people who I've spent over the last 13 years of my life with Sojourn Theater a lot of time and energy with. These people are one way I define place for myself. And they're right there right now. Maybe there's a five second lag, but they're like with me right now. Not just sort of in spirit, they can hear me. And they can text me, because that's how the world works. They could call me, they could tweet me, and if I had a phone like a lot of you do, I could look at it right now. Like, we are sharing time, if not physical space. My wife and my daughter, if my daughter hasn't gone down for her nap yet, are watching right now. Not because they are particularly interested in what I have to say, but <laughs> because I asked them to watch for a little bit right now. So I can look at that camera, and I can say, um, I can say hi, Nina, if you're watching. Hello, have a good nap, I love you. I'll see you late tonight. So my daughter's hearing that right now if she's watching. I am certainly in a place with her right now more than I am with you in that moment of saying that and looking at that. So I just want to make sure that we continue to complicate the idea of place as we think about making place. That it is not just geography. That it is not just the area which has an economic impact around it. That it is not just indexes. Now all those things are important and related to work when we are being intentional and when we are working on projects collaboratively that need goals and that need to be in conversation with entities outside our own personal experience, right? Geography is also place. Shared values are place. History is place. But I think particularly when we're mixing the arts and any kind of activity that anyone chooses to identify as creative and imaginative, if we are not talking about the potential for blurry boundaries and broken barriers and things that aren't easily measurable, we are reducing something. So I just, I just want to note technology is only, only one way, just like a cheap, clever parlor trick to sort of note place in relation to time in this moment. So I have something I'd like to ask you to do. I'd like to ask you to turn to your partner. And I'm going to give you like a minute, maybe 90 seconds. I just want to ask you to talk to your partner about your own personal experience of place. What does it mean to you? We've been hearing really, really great presentations and conversations about the making of place in relation to trends and funding and national definitions. What does place mean to you? Just you and your partner. Talk about that for like a minute and a half or so. Thanks, Shug.
few more moments. All right, I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask you to pause, please. And um, could I could I ask just just words, maybe like a short phrase? Just give me a sense of what some of the ways you talked about place were just now. Not asking for stories or repeats of whole conversations. Just words or like short phrases. Place meant to you? Culture. Culture. Place means? Community. Community. Place means? Home. Home. Place means? Familiarity. Familiarity. Place means? Something that's gone. Something that's gone. Place means? Belonging. Belonging. Place means? Fluidity, place means? Borrowed. Borrowed, place means? Learning, learning place means? Comfort. Comfort, place means? Impact. Impact, place means? Civic engagement. Civic engagement, place means? Consciousness. Consciousness, place means? Light. Light, light place means? Environment. Environment, place means? Mind. 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 Visual aesthetic. Visual aesthetic, place means? Sense of rootedness, place means aesthetics. Others. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. I got a text from two company members just then saying, We're right here in place. This was fun. So two of them, two of them are watching. That's nice. And with us. Thank you, guys. Um, all right, so we're gonna we're gonna the answer to this is here we are. Uh, but let's talk about practice and process. So I've got some ideas I want to move through, and I also want to share some examples of work and talk about some projects, but we have some time here together, and I want to make sure we keep sort of having conversations as a whole group and in small. So these are three core questions that, I, that I'm about to share with you that I feel like um, are sort of at the center of what I'm interested in right now. So, so I'm the artistic director of Sojourn Theater, a 13-year-old ensemble-based company that works around the country on a variety of projects, and I'll talk about some as we go. Gesundheit. And I am also uh, the founding director of the Center for Performance and Civic Practice, which is a two and a half year old, what I call a resource, that uh, in, is involved with programs, projects, research initiatives, and supporting artists and models in the field. And I'll talk about some of that stuff as well. These three questions I'm about to share with you feel like they're at the heart of both those endeavors currently, and I am want to see if these questions are interesting or resonate with you. How do we develop partnerships and for what reasons? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put a question up and I'm going to invite you and your partner just for 60 seconds to just reflect on the question and how it lands with you. Because probably the question is or isn't interesting to you or makes you think about one thing and might make your partner think about a different thing. So I'm not so much saying at this moment, tell a story about this question. Although you can, if that's your way into this prompt I'm giving you. But I'm also just saying, how do we develop partnerships and for what reasons? Is that a part of something you think about? Is that a part of your work? Is that a part of things of interest to you? So for 60 seconds, you and your partner, just to help land these questions in this place we are building, just chat about that for a minute. Time is yours. Thirty seconds. I'm gonna say hold, please. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask for your, your focus up this way again. 
I think hopefully each of these questions as a prompt is maybe starting a conversation that I'm definitely not giving you time to finish. And these are questions that I'm going to spend time me sharing and asking us to share together. So this question is not going to disappear. I'm going to go on to another one now, but then I'm going to be working on unpacking this with you throughout our time together this morning. Because this comes through a lot of the project examples I'm going to talk about and some ideas I'm going to share. Here's the next question. How do we translate our role, our work, and our assets in non-arts contexts? How do we translate? Translation's a big, at the Center for Performance and Civic Practice, translation, big, big, big mission. Big mission. How do we translate our role, our work, and our assets in non-arts contexts? 60 seconds with your partner just to talk about how that question lands for you, if it's interesting, what it makes you think about. 60 seconds. Thirty seconds. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt and ask to pause you again. So I'm gonna go on to the third and last question in this grouping, although it's, um, it's, it's a bit in the, I think this is the right way to use this phrase, feels to me like the language is a bit in the weeds, so I've actually got two versions of this question. Because I, I, I was like, well this is what I talk about, but I think I need to clarify it a little bit. First version is, what process tools do artists possess that can allow us to broaden the way we and our non-arts partners conceptualize arts-based activity, interventions, and collaboration. How do we get expert at making and translating proposals that don't look like the traditional output product result of our respective disciplines? Laura gave great examples of this when she was talking yesterday about the 180 projects and artists working with partners and developing all kinds of things that were focused on their discipline but that were really just expansive, right, in terms of the ways they approached creatively exploring those relationships and some kind of expression. So just, this is the question to give you 60 seconds on. How do we get expert at making and translating proposals that don't look like the traditional output product result of our respective disciplines? I'm not asking you to answer that in 60 seconds. I'm asking you to just think about what does that question raise for you? Is it a familiar question? Do you think about it a lot? Is it interesting to you? So just giving you a minute to, to think about that because it's certainly something I'm going to talk about as we go through this morning. 60 seconds are yours. Thirty seconds.
Last moments. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring you back up this way. Um, so I'm so appreciative that you are so game this morning to dive into these conversations, and I'm hoping that they feel like an active way to be in conversation together in a space where that's sort of challenging. Um, so now I'm going to actually go through a couple of these slides and, and sort of set up a frame for some ideas that I want to talk about before we go back into a pair. So I'm just going to take a couple minutes on that, um, and then we'll do a little more talking, and then we'll get to projects. I really wrestled with whether I should put the projects on the front end and then go into sort of some framing ideas, but I decided that just, you know, there's, I've been really enjoying and interested in the conversation we've been having, and I wanted to start with some ideas and frames and then move into examples. So if you seem awake, that will have been the right choice. If you do not, that will be clear. So we'll see how that goes. So um, this, is, this is what I think about. This is what's interesting to me, what's important to me. Theater is a form of civic activity making performance as the practice of encounters, intervening, participating in public process. Particularly when I'm gonna talk about civic practice with you as we go down the, the path of this conversation a little bit, but this is, uh, this, is, this is where I think about the kind of work that for me is the most closely related to the conversations happening around placemaking. So let me, let me get into that a little. First of all, public process. Oh, I should say this. I really like language and vocabulary. I find it incredibly um, difficult in our field as we are moving forward and we have more and more cross-disciplinary activity and conversation and cross-sector work. The fact that we have been so siloed for so long, both within the arts in different disciplines and then of course between the arts and other sectors, means that we have language we are comfortable with that makes it very hard for us to be in conversation with others very often. So I feel like I spent a bunch of time um, waiting for um, the fields to do the language work of carving out the shared definitions. And a few years ago, I started to feel like I am not seeing it happen in a way that I am satisfied with, so I am going to start doing that. Consciously, I'm going to try to create language that I can define my own work and interests in. I'm going to share that not in a belief that if people don't frame their things in the way I'm saying that they're wrong, people can frame things however they want to frame things, but this helps me be in conversation with colleagues and particularly with people in other fields. And in different places where I work, and I'll talk about stuff, I'm finding some of these distinctions useful when bringing artists and non-art civic partners to tables together. Finding some of these distinctions very useful. So that's the, the idea I'm working with. So for instance, public process, this is one of the wordiest slides. There's not a lot this wordy. But encounters where people intentionally gather to wrestle with issues that impact lives inside and outside the room. That's, for me, a way to think about public process. Yeah? Encounters where people intentionally gather to wrestle with issues that impact lives inside and outside the room. It's broad. It's general. But it's a framework for what we're going to talk about here. Government, health, education, business, community development, social services, policy planning, all environments, there's many more, where public process happens. But public process doesn't always refer to the inclusion of all voices. It is, in fact, sometimes and often exclusive. So how can artists impact the representation values and functionality of and within public process in a variety of settings? Does that make sense, that question? Are we with? OK. I'm assuming if I get something and it's like, I don't know what the hell he's talking about, that someone will be like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Or like, could you please clarify that a little bit? Yeah? OK. So we know. So I'm going to go forward from that a little bit. And I'm going to say this. This is, a, this is a big part of the conversation today for me. In theater and in public process, are our models of encounter examples of monologue or dialogue? That, for me, frames all the work and the work in response to other work. Are our models of encounter examples of monologue or dialogue? What is the exchange? What is the relationship? What is the experience? Certainly, this room, this space is set up in a monological way. 
right? I'm up here doing this, I'm talking at you. This is a monologue. I'm, I'm inviting moments of dialogue, we're going to have some dialogue, but the structure of this event and presentation is monological. Why? Because I'm on a stage where theater happens, which is traditionally a monological form. We can have a conversation about we share breath together, we are in a space together, yes, but we're in a monological presentational form, I would suggest, framework-wise. So, I want to suggest that monologue form, us to them, a presentation, a witness, and an agent of action, the actor, the delivery of content. I want to suggest a dialogue form, us becomes we, an exchange, an experience of co-making, a partnership-based event. I'm going to go back for a moment before I go forward. What is the exchange? What is the relationship? What is the experience? I'd love to ask you and your partner for a moment to talk about your experience, both of the art that you make and are interested in, and of public experiences you have that you might define as public process. And I'd like you to talk for, I'm going to give you two minutes talk about this idea of monologue or dialogue. And I'm not saying that monologue bad, dialogue good. Monologue sometimes really useful as a frame, as a form of expression, right? Dialogue, sometimes not the most useful way for a particular thing. So I'm not trying to lay a values judgment on it, but I am interested in the conversation about intentionality and purpose in relation to form. And what often happens around the making of place, I think often is monological activity that is discussing its intentions as an as a us becoming we. Yeah? So I want to ask right now if you and your partner would just talk a little bit about this idea of when are you in public spaces for art and public process where you kind of go, this, this is monological, that's good, that's bad. This is dialogical, that's good, that's bad. Just talking about your own experience of this idea. And if you're going, he's throwing these words around, just I'm asking you to talk for a couple minutes about the exchange that occurs, the relationship that gets built, the experience you have. Yeah? Two minutes to talk with your partner about events, art events, public events, monologue and dialogue experiences. Two minutes.
about 30 seconds. sideways as and just before I go forward and just sort of mention something about this monologue dialogue um, framework. We've, we've, uh, this has come up a couple times over the last 24 hours uh, here at the symposium. This, um, and Anne talked about it a little bit last night. This idea that we have, um, we are in a moment when people want to engage and interact with uh, art in different ways than they have before and our, our, our dome, our wonder dome this morning kind of got at this a little bit and we talked about it in terms of opera revolution. It, it, it comes up, right? People want to participate. These are the big, big buzzwords in the field now. Engagement, participation. They're framed in, in ways that are sometimes muddled and confused, but, but there's people sort of barreling in. Irvine Foundation, giant study impacting a lot of work happening out in California. And Mellon putting a lot of money into engagement. Duke putting a lot of money into building demand is another way of thinking about engagement. So I want to I want to sort of um, maybe articulate for you what being in a, a lot of conversations in different places has sort of clarified for me in the past couple years, which is that um, to talk about those words and then talk about policies and practices, you also have to talk about values and intentions and and form. And what I see happening a lot is institutions, often larger but not exclusively, institutions that are attempting to understand changes in the demographics of their communities and changes in their audience constituencies in terms of decreasing, in terms of challenges connecting with people, and often assuming that by creating more engaged and participatory programming, they can gather in the people who they want to reach and are not necessarily reaching. But I think one of the challenges there is that when an institution exists in a larger frame of a monological relationship to its community, meaning that it chooses and curates what to present, how to present it, and where to present it, none of these things I think are bad. But when an institution is working from that framework, then adding ancillary activities that are engaged and participatory, that they are indeed expanding the possibilities of how their audiences relate to them. But the thing they're really trying to address is a deeper dialogical impulse in the larger world, particularly generationally and particularly neighborhood by neighborhood. That this movement towards co-making, co-authorship, collaboration is not necessarily satisfied in deeply meaningful ways by ancillary programs that deepen the dramaturgical impact of pre-chosen content. Yeah? that it is actually about how work and experiences are made together and how place is made together. And the reason that I sort of start with this monologue and dialogue framework to go into, as I start to get to examples a little, is I think that um, if I just think about the pitches this morning and I think about the Wonder Dome, um, I just like saying Wonder Dome. It's a good phrase. It's really fun. Wonder Dome. Think about the Wonder Dome. It is Wonder Dome, right? It is Wonderdome. Yeah, uh, it would be embarrassing if I was saying the wrong thing, like Thunderdome. It's Wonderdome. Uh, so when you think about Wonderdome, Wonderdome is either something that uh, is an interactive experience, but somebody sort of shapes what the experience is. This kind of gets to what Sarah was asking about. Or is it an experience that somebody participates in the co-making of content and experience, and even the choosing of how it's deployed in a community? Like, in a monological or dialogical kind of approach, Wonderdome can go both ways. Who are you trying to engage and why? Similarly with Opera Revolution, 
I love music and musicals, Gesundheit. I'm not a particularly large opera fan, but I'm up for opera revolution making me an opera lover. That's exciting. I'm going to be most invested in that if I feel like opera revolution isn't commissioning somebody to write something and then figuring out how to get me in a bar to see it, but that there's actually something going on in relation to place and story that I can invest in and feel connected to. Um, so I, I, and I'm, not, I'm trying not to leave collab act out. Where's, where's collab act? Are you here? Yeah, collab, collab acts? Collab arts, I'm sorry, collab arts. Because collab arts has at the center of it already, right, an impulse for collaboration. It's for collaboration for artists from different disciplines. So it's interesting, do those artists come together and choose what to make and then other people are invited in or does collab arts actually exist as something that invites potential stakeholders from all over the community in to be a part of collab arts and into a part of the generation of material or the strategies for how the material lands through a variety of distribution and engagement opportunities. You know, So what are we trying to do? Why are we trying to do it? How are we trying to do it? It feels super related, so I want to say dig deeper into dialogue because I'm, I'm interested, right, I'm interested in the dialogue side of things. Sometimes I make shows in the monological framework, I get asked to, but in general I'm really interested in the dialogical side of things. In dialogue focused encounters in the field of time-based arts, I propose we have two modalities of practice. I am doing this, now I'm going to jump sideways this way. You guys have heard of the term social practice. It's used a lot, and here even, socially engaged practice. And Social practice comes out of the visual art world, but is now being used more and more expansively to represent, not sure exactly what, know the history of it, but today lots of people claim it as a way to think about anything that has artists working with non-artists. And then people will tell you that there are different kind of ways of framing that. I am sort of finding that that particular um, frame is a little messy when artists deal with community partners. Because the question becomes, what is the purpose that the artist is connecting with community for? Is it the realization of a vision that the artist has conceived? Or is it a response to uh, conversation and needs in a community? I don't think those things have to be mutually exclusive. But I do think they're different impulses and intentions. And I asked Laura this question yesterday when she was talking about those 180 projects and, and naturally the variety of projects and where they fall. So something that I've been thinking a lot about is, it's reductive, but I find it useful, perhaps useful, social practice and civic practice. So I'm going to sort of talk about each of these briefly and then get to some pictures. Well, that pictures are nicer than words sometimes. So are we doing okay? Are you with me? Are we doing okay? Question, Laura. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm leaning into performance in this moment just because although I'm interested in buckets that open up across discipline, I certainly feel like my expertise is speaking about time-based theater and performance. And so when I'm trying to sort of lay definitions out that are useful, I don't quite feel appropriate in saying although I do feel and I'm in conversation with people in design and visual arts a lot about this. But I, I put that up there so, so I don't seem more presumptuous than I'm probably already seeming. So, yeah. So, social practice. Wow, that's small. Wow, okay, so I'm going to read that. But I just said it, but I just put it up here, but I said a shorter version of it. Initiates with an artist's desire to explore, create a conceptual event or moment of their design. The design and or execution may engage non-artists in many ways. Now here's where it gets interesting and important to me and I'm, I'm, you know, I've been really excited to be in this conversation with all of you and with Laura and Roberto and, and Anne because, because of these outcomes that I think different artists approach projects through. So a social practice project may engage non-artists in many ways. It may leverage non-arts partners and community resources. It may intend to specifically impact the social or civic life of the context in which it occurs in measurable ways. Yeah? It may intend to exist as an aesthetic interruption from which impacts is to be derived in an open interpretive manner, a moment of delight, stained glass on a chain link fence. Yeah, perhaps. But whatever social or civic needs the project addresses, the leading impulse and guiding origin energy is from the artist in a social practice project. 
In a civic practice project, it's activity where an artist employs the assets of his or her craft in response to the needs of non-arts partners as determined through ongoing relationship-based dialogue. The impulse of what to make comes out of the relationship, not an artist-driven proposal on the front end. Which does not mean that the artist does not make the proposal and bring their expertise and lead the work, because I believe they, they do. But it is a difference of relationship, partnership, collaborative design, and desired outcome. So I'm putting that out there. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now I'm going to look at some different projects. Laura, please. So in terms of desired outcome, yeah. as maybe redactive, but do you consider yourself to be the artist that is the artist? You're asking me if I see it that way. No, that's a great question. For me, the desired outcome of social practice could be a process. It does, does not have to be like an object or a one-time event or a show. Um, I'll, I'll show some examples of it, but I'm trying to think through what you shared yesterday. Um, so flipping through some of those examples, uh, Black Dog, Chain Link Fence, I'm trying to think of a process one. Well, for instance, the performance is happening at the Vietnamese restaurant. Yes, there were performance moments, but it seems like there's a process, a practice that's resulting out of that that is in an ongoing way serving desired outcomes both for the business owner and a venue for artists to sort of be seen and bring audiences. But it's not a one-time thing. And I would even suggest that the social capital of the eventness of it is a product as well as the actual performative moments. So to me, all of that is outcome, not just the thing. And, and in civic practice, yes, relationship, but also like, a thing, or an event, or a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Elizabeth. Yeah. So this actually came um, to a head, uh, or in when Suzanne was here, right? Well, yeah, but, but also uh, Suzanne Lacey. Yeah, yeah, Suzanne Lacey. Did you, some of you guys get to meet or hear Suzanne? Yeah. yeah. You guys can hear Elizabeth? Yeah. Okay. Other great. issues about place. And so we as a team decided with being probably like the most unsustainable city in the world. Um, <laughs> that this might be something that we could engage with. You know, so so how can we even initiate a civic practice if people don't uh, if partners don't even it's a it's a have great it's a great it's a great question and like such a great example. I mean, in my mind, first of all, I think social practice projects are awesome and important. And not like, it's not like a one is more sort of relevant. I feel like most projects that happen with artists and community fall under this lens. And I am interested in expanding the potential of civic practice projects, not instead of, but in addition to. So that's really important. And I would also say that in response to your question, I'm thinking about that a lot these days. I don't know the story at all of what you're describing, but I would say one way to get a non-arts partner to think about sustainability is to go to them with an idea for a sustainability project, as you did, to share how your tools could be useful to them. Super great. Another way is to go to a non-arts partner and 
learn about what they do in relation to sustainability over some time, and then in listening to that, figure out what assets you have that could make um, a conceptually surprising proposal that might be surprising to you as well as to them. Uh, and what would result out of that would be a project that might be exactly what you did or might be something that neither of you could imagine at the beginning. Yes, because a relationship's developing. Absolutely. Yes. 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 Whereas who's gonna fund me to hang out and make relationships? No, no. It's a great question. And you know you know how you know how that you know how that works, I believe. It's the difference between um, well, first of all, it's hugely relevant for a lot of artists who are in school building their work as entrepreneurs. And I, I certainly, like I can say for myself, like in the early 90s when I started Hope is Vital, an organization I started doing work with homeless men and women living with HIV and or AIDS, like I didn't get paid to build those relationships. Like I built those relationships because I was interested in those relationships and what art space work could come out of it, which led to funding that actually nobody knew was available for the arts because of that cross-sector relationship. It's very hard to get funding on the front end to build a relationship. It's not hard, actually, to develop a relationship that's cross-sector and then together come up with an idea and then get that funded. So granted, like if every hour of your day in your early struggling years needs to be a paid hour to pay the rent, it's hard to find the time to build relationships. But on the other hand, you got to do it. I mean, that's the definition of being entrepreneurial. It's starting doing work that you're not getting paid for because you believe it's going to lead to something you're growing yourself. But I totally hear that. And I, I can say that the very question you're asking is the reason that at the center, I've been working to fund this thing called the Catalyst Initiative, which is actually going to fund artists to build relationships with partners in five pilot cities around the country to find the time to develop a conceptually surprising proposal. And, and I hit on that again because this is also, I saw some of you said new work makers, right? I also want to say that I think that the future of new work, there's a place called People's Light and Theater outside Philadelphia. Am I saying the name right? People's Light and Theater? Super interesting theater and they just started this really interesting residence they got a lot of money for. I don't remember from where. But basically, they're, they're exploring this idea that by embedding an artist in a community that does not have relationships with artists and giving that artist time to build relationships, the work that gets made will look different than the work the artist would have made without that relationship and will look different contextually than work that theater would have presented in their building because it's going to be outsighted in a public space. So I actually think that part of the future of new work development is in relationships that are cross-sector because we have to make proposals that are conceptually different than what we are used to offering. I, we talked about this yesterday. If you are a theater practitioner and all you know about what your process can lead to is a play, then a play is your hammer and everything you encounter is a nail. Am I saying that right? Meaning that you think a play is the answer to everything. A play is not the answer to everything. We're going to look at that as well. Love plays, lots of things theater artists time-based artists bring to the table that results in product process that does not necessarily look like a play. And that's a big part of thinking about this work as well. I saw, I had a hand here, yeah? And then come right here and then I'll keep going. This is exciting. Look, we're like talking about this stuff. This is really exciting. Yeah. So to an extent, you're saying like you don't feel that either one is better than the other. Um, and like maybe it's a specific building or relation or something that the picture strives for. Well, I, I'm not even saying that. I think there are, there are artists who do both. I just think that this is a field of work that offers kinds of projects, employability, and community utility that we don't take advantage of and don't offer. Do you, do you see that with the distinction that it's, that it's being maybe just an implied hierarchical idea for, for other people? I'm not saying that you have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? I think where it lends the potential hierarchy is it gives a community partner the possibility of being informed and actually in an authentic power relationship with an artist. Because what happens often is artists will start a project and a community partner hears this and what they get is this. 
And that hierarchy, which is reversed and puts the community partner at a disadvantage, is a real problem because what it leads to all over the country are community partners who've been burned by arts projects where actually their desired outcomes and their interests were not primary. But the way the partnership was developed, they thought their outcome was primary. So I, I actually feel like I hear you, and I think there are partners who would be like, oh, I'm understanding this distinction. This is what I'm interested in. That's great for the artist to know, because that's going to lead to a better, more honest project. And it's also going to lead to finding the partners that are going to be more interested in this. So, yeah. Very challenging point you bring up. I'm glad you bring it up. I have a response to it. One is, yes, I hear you, and yes. But the other is, I think, in some contexts, that perspective is used as a way to prevent artists from having to actually, A, be aware of who they are and aren't in conversation with, and B, be able to remain sort of elites and have a voice that is protected because they need to comment from the outside. Yes, I believe artists should be able to comment from outside, but in terms of their utility, like we need artists, we need artists to um, speak things that aren't being spoken in other ways and forms of resistance. Yes, I, I think a lot of that work in this country is very often aimed at people who already share that perspective and isn't actually received by many people who don't already share that perspective. And there's often a a stridency or didacticism to it. So I agree with what you're saying and also sort of um, uh, warily just want to acknowledge that I think that can also be a way to um, sometimes avoid conversations between artists and community. It's, it's, it's the thing about authorship as well. When you, like you use the word pander, which I think is, is a really tricky word because it, it sort of states an assumption that if I am partnering in community authentically, that I'm actually not able to A, speak truthfully, and B, make work that is challenging, because I have to satisfy uh, and dilute. And I think that's a perspective on what happens during collaboration and partnership, but actually not what happens in good practice of collaboration and partnership. So, but I, but I hear you, and I really appreciate that point. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, Julie. I know what you're saying, and it partly relates to the notion of invitation and charge that uh, Laura talked about yesterday. I, I feel like I want to answer that um, with a story that acknowledges my own personal pathology, um, which maybe some of you share, which is um, um, uh, one of the projects you'll see me deal with here is a, a really great project. We were involved in and continue to work on the Penelope Project, where we worked with a long-term care facility and made, created an adaptation outside Milwaukee 
uh, of the Odyssey called Finding Penelope, where we worked with men and women living with Alzheimer's and dementia and their caregivers and families and created this giant site-specific performance. And so I was in and out along with my company members and doing a lot of learning about um, working in senior facilities. And I have never put the energy. I don't have any grandparents left now. My last grandmother, grandparent, died about four years ago, maybe five years ago. Never put the energy into the elders in my family that I have put into working with elders on projects. I don't know if other people have that experience in terms of partnerships and work you've done where you realize that you are putting a tremendous amount of your time and energy and heart into something that you have actually not done in your backyard. And I don't think it's bad because I feel really good about that work, but I certainly try to reflect occasionally on what has kept me from doing that work in my own household, you know? And I try to learn from it and be better with my parents who are older and on that, you know, they're, they're getting up there. Um, so that's one response. And my second response is, I'm someone who like spent literally most of the 90s living out of a suitcase working in different communities, invited in to do work around community issues, so was an outside artist for years and years in urban, suburban, rural communities all over, and had to spend energy figuring out the ethics of that, how I felt about that, with the practice of that, when to give that energy, and when to not give that energy, and do the work, and how to learn through it. Um, so the, that's the long answer. The short answer is I think it's really great and significant to look in our own backyard. I think the model working in neighborhoods that Springboard does where the start is there is super powerful and a great way to both map assets and maximize capacity. Um, I also think that there's a tremendous role for the artist in places that they are not of or from, whether it's one mile away or 100 miles away or 1,000 miles away or 10,000 miles away. But I think that that is a set of practices that adds on a layer of complexity um, and intentionality and awareness that is different than when you work in a four block radius. Thank you. So, yeah. Maybe last one and then I'll, I'll go on to project stuff. Yeah. The word dramaturgy in relation to this work is, is so important to me. We were talking about this a little bit yesterday. I mean, I, I, I'm just someone who firmly believes, and I'll, I guess I'll get to this a little, but just the idea that city, we're such a mess in terms of governance in this country. We're just such a mess on so many levels. And every city council, every state legislature, every body engaged in public process with decision-making responsibility desperately needs a dramaturg. De I mean, desperately. Desperately needs a dramaturg. Uh, as do the artists. No, as do the artists. But I, I'm literally saying, like, the, the artist in residence as dramaturgical presence around process and content, and I'm going to talk about some of those tools, is something that we have not moved into with confidence and force and will in a way that would serve our communities so healthily. But anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to go on. Um, so naming some artist assets. This starts to get at this a little bit. Talking about like how do we talk about what we have when we're in conversation. So this is, this is a couple that I talk about and use sometimes. Collaboration, and this is not just time-based art, this is artists, but particularly theater artists, actually, in terms of this first one. Turning constituents with varied self-interests into coalitions of stakeholders. That is what happens in a rehearsal room, or a classroom, or a teaching artist setting, or many community settings. Design. This is, a, a lot, this is like a whole nother day that we could and should have, but the idea that we need to share the term design with those who self-define as designers, because you design. Problem solving through highly imaginative and collaborative action. You do that, we do that. Designers is not just a visual field. There are people coming out of Pratt and Parsons 
every year with a concentration in experienced design who were getting hired by major firms, mostly in New York, DC, London, Chicago, Los Angeles, to work on teams that are designing housing for 100 million people in China, public transit in Russia, um, better city systems in Philadelphia, Detroit, and Cleveland. They are hiring people that are defined as experienced designers. Do you know what they specialize in? They specialize in bodies in space. They specialize in narrative and framing. They specialize in time and understanding systems. They do what you do, and they are being invited to tables that we are not invited to because we do not define our assets in relation to those kinds of processes. Expression, synthesizing complex data and articulating it in ways that can be comprehended and interrogated. So these are just three assets I just kind of want to name in that way. So this is a question, I'm going to go back to you in pairs. I'm almost at pictures. But I just want to ask you guys to talk two minutes with the partner. But here's what I'm interested in. An experience when an artist asset, maybe it's one of these, maybe it's something else you define as an asset you bring to the table as an artist, was used in a surprising moment or context. So I'm going to say not in the rehearsal room, not in the studio. Maybe this is a moment when you feel like you used it. Maybe it's a moment when you were aware of someone else bringing it. Maybe you were a part of a public process where someone creatively was a part of an accomplishment. Maybe this is around the Thanksgiving dinner table. And it's literally that definition of collaboration. I wish I was better at that definition of collaboration at my family's Thanksgiving tables. <laughs> My larger families, thanks to you. Not my home family. <laughs> so two minutes with your partner. Do you, can you think of, and if you can't think of an exact example of this one, that's okay. Just talking about the assets artists bring to the table outside the traditional usages we put them to. Two minutes with your partner. Re remind yourself who your partner is. About 30 seconds. if that's okay. Um, and what I'd like to ask is, again, not asking you to repeat the conversation you just had, but just like phrase or words in response to what were you talking about in terms of artist assets or interesting usage? Anybody sort of pop for me just like a phrase, a couple words? Smart room. Smart room. Say that again? Attention getters. Attention getters. Interesting. Uh, being able to say yes and. Being able to say yes and. Feasibility? Feasibility. Writing mission statements. Writing mission statements. Engaging with students a lot. 
Engaging with the physical body. Reframing a non-artistic problem in an artistic sense. Persuasiveness and the use of use of artistic energy when presenting. Persuasiveness and the use of artistic energy when presenting. Shared vision, team, leadership, and communication. Shared vision, team, leadership, and communication. Yes, sir. Kinetic learning. Kinetic learning. I want to see kinetic learning in the Wonder Dome. I just want to say. <laughs> what else? Happen. That could happen. Now, there are others? Okay, so now we're super close to actually looking at something other than words. So I'm gonna give some examples of social practice projects. So the, the deal is I'm just gonna like show pictures of a couple projects and give tiny descriptions of them. And then the same with a couple civic practice projects. And then I'm gonna go back through them with more pictures. And I'm gonna sort of note, here's a way to think about these projects in terms of engagement strategies, participation strategies, relationship to intention, yeah? So we'll go through and, and see if this is interesting, see if this stays interesting. So first one, witness our schools. Oh, it's like what Ann said is right. It does look kind of, can you see it? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's John O, founding company member at Sojourn. So this is a project we did that we spent three years on. Um, so, so again, this is a so, social practice projects in my mind now. When we made these projects, I was not thinking about these distinctions or definitions. We were making projects. Um, Witness Our Schools, piece about public education in America, in Oregon, where we were based. Uh, we interviewed about 500 people around the state over a year and a half. I don't know if you know this, but Oregon has terrible public education issues, like many states. But at the time we started work on this, in 2003, it was 49th in terms of it was the bottom of public ed in the country. And we actually had a situation where you might have, in 2003, you might have seen this Doonesbury cartoon. Because in 2003, on the floor of the state legislature in Oregon, at the Capitol, a legislator threw a stapler at the head of another legislator because they couldn't agree on a budget. And so they literally started fighting on the floor of the legislature. And they had to recess the state legislature early, which meant that every public school in Oregon closed four weeks early because they ran out of money. Every public school in Oregon closed four weeks early. And it was on the tail of that that we were working on the tour, you know, we were in the habit of making a touring show for schools as a part of what we did. And one of our board members was like, let's not make a touring show for schools. Let's make a show about what the fuck is going on with our schools. I'm so sorry that went out on live stream. So sorry. Maybe even my daughter, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, that's, that was the conversation. Uh, so we started working on this project. And this actually relates to something Elizabeth asked in a way, which is just that we took on this project. We knew it was a multi-year project. We had like a nickel. And the budget we came up with was $295,000 to do what we felt we needed to do. And we just started. And we started interviewing. And Elizabeth has done this a million times. This is, she's done this too. A lot of people in here have done this. So we knew that there were partnerships that we had to develop. Uh, we ended up working with the state legislature, the Department of Education, unions, um, uh, anti-union organizations. We interviewed students, teachers, school board members, political leaders, mayors, lieutenant governors, all these people. And we created this piece. And the piece toured Oregon for nine months. Every Sunday for nine months, we did a free performance in a different town at 2 p.m. on Sunday, followed by a town hall dialogue where local political leaders and constituents, and constituents who often weren't in these conversations in terms of diversity and voice, were in these rooms. And the show was 65 minutes. The public dialogue was 90 minutes. And the public dialogue was based in improvisation and performative strategies and facilitation. And that show ended up being performed on the floor of the legislature for the House and Senate. No staplers were thrown, and we had a good conversation about it. This is another social practice project. This is like the Jono show, I guess. There's Jono again with a mustache years later. Um, so this is a show, again, I, I would define this as a social practice project because um, we got interested in the urban-rural conversation and the values division in this country, which would come up in a lot of our projects, but we hadn't directly addressed it. So we, uh, we wanted to do something different. We felt like in a lot of projects that look at urban-rural, people go to urban and they get stories and they take them to rural or they go to rural and they get stories and they take them to urban. That's like the kind of sharing that would happen. 
And we said, we want to make an art project that brings the audiences together physically. We do not want to build a metaphorical bridge. We want to build a literal bridge to have a conversation about values and polarization. So we made a show that had two act ones, simultaneous. One act one is in Malala, Oregon, in the Elk Barn on a ranch, a town of 7,000 people, 50 miles away from Portland. And the other act one is in a church in North Portland, an African-American neighborhood. And the two act ones had different casts, different audiences happening simultaneously. Act two, on the bus. Both audiences got on school buses and drove towards each other. And while they're on the bus, act two happens, which is a combo of live video and of live performance. And as a part of that bus trip, they make a cell phone call to an audience member on the other bus so they can catch up on what they missed in the other audience's act one. And then act three, is they arrive at a parking lot overlooking a river in a dead industrial corridor in central Oregon. Not central Oregon, central between Malala and Portland. And they're overlooking this river and they arrive on the school buses at the same time and there's a banquet set out for them, a locally sourced, organic, freshly cooked meal. And they basically get off the buses and five people from Malala sit at a table with five people from Portland and they are the guests at a fictional wedding reception and there's a live rock band, and there's the bride and groom, and the bride and groom are the descendants of the first act people that they encountered in their respective acts. So act three is they witness the coming together of these two places, but they meet a couple who are having relationship troubles because of their different backgrounds. And the audience has to help problem solve how this marriage can happen. So the obvious metaphor, a state that is bound, a couple that is about to be bound, how do we talk and think about that? So that was a project that we worked for about a year and a half on. $10 tickets for the whole event, including the meal, because we super prioritize access for everything. A lot of our shows are free. Uh, the race, uh, another social practice project, we were invited to be in residence at Georgetown University for two years, where we built a show that opened three days before Obama was elected. It was a show about leadership in America, and it was a show that worked uh, using interviews and other participatory research methods around DC to talk to people about um, leadership in America and what the country wanted at this moment. And it opened before Obama was elected, it ran election night, and it ran after the election. So, and it was a show that was both scripted and choreographed, but also had open structures. And you'll see in a little while, I'm going to show you an image of someone Skyping in from Dublin because we had an international Skype chorus that was a part of the show that would participate in the conversations. So I want to say when Anne was talking yesterday about participation and interaction, like that's kind of what we do. And, and these are projects I'm giving you that are sort of in the conversation about that work out in the world. Uh, this is a piece called Built, which is a, yeah, a question. Uh, witness our schools um, came mostly from foundations in Oregon, private donors, and we got a MAP fund grant, which was a big thing for us, like a blue chip grant from Creative Capital and Rockefeller that helped loosen up some money. We were still raising money through the last performance to get there. Um, this project, we've been established for a while longer, an NEA grant, um, foundations, some the city council in Malala and the arts council in Malala gave us small grants, the county commission for the arts. Uh, the race, mostly, more and more, we tour and do residencies and build work. So this is a fee situation from Georgetown, who basically hosted and sponsored us to do this, and they wrote grants to get us in there. Uh, Built is a project that had different foundation money and was commissioned by an artist in residence program and by a big festival. The time-based art festival out in Portland, PICA's TBA. Um, so it was presented by a variety of partners. So we do a lot of fundraising and a lot of partner building over time. Uh, this is a show about how city, this is probably the show that in a way is most directly content related to this symposium in that this is a show we made about how cities are changing and demographic change. And what you see is, a, a lot of our work is site specific, as you can tell, but this is, um, most of you have probably been to an Ikea store, maybe. 
So have you ever been to like a, a condo show space? Well, it's kind of like an IKEA store where they set up fake kitchens and living rooms and bathrooms and you walk through. So we were invited to make this show as part of this fancy glass condo thing rising up in Portland by the river. Does anyone here know Portland at all? You must know Portland, yeah. Some people know Portland. So they built the, the South Waterfront. And we were invited to make something and we said, well, what we want to make is a, we want to make something about the complications of how many people hate what you're doing here but how it's also viewed by some as really necessary in terms of the economic revitalization of the city. So let's make a show about how complicated that is. So we, after working on it for eight or nine months, we got the main developer to allow us to stage the show in their condo show space. So this is a quarter million dollar white model that exists, that is their main sort of pride that they bring people through to, through to look at. And that is their vision of what the South Waterfront would look like when it was done being built. So we staged the tightrope dance over it for a part of the show where our actors were literally in danger of destroying a quarter million dollar object, which felt very relevant to some of the stuff we were taking on, um, in that if we destroyed it, it would never be paid for, which is what's going on in that neighborhood in a lot of ways. Um, so this show was a combination of participation. We used a game structure that I'll talk about a little bit more, where the audience actually built a city collaboratively over the course of the show. This is a show Elizabeth mentioned yesterday at some point that she saw. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk through it because this show has led to a civic practice project that we are now doing um, that I'll talk about in a second. So there's four social practice projects that are like shows with public expressions and manifestations where partnerships grew out of our desire to make an artwork with and about factors, populations, issues, and resulted in these events that people could come and experience. Yeah? And then I want to look at Built 2.0 as the first one. So you see, this picture is built in 2008, the show. This picture is built in 2012 in rural Virginia. And basically what happened was that show lived on as a bit of a rumor in urban planning communities and schools because a lot of planners had seen the show. And we basically invented a game for that show, this game. And we called that show a participatory civic planning game with performance interruptions. And we had planners start coming to us. Yeah. A participatory civic planning game. Harris likes that name a participatory civic planning game with performance interruptions. And planners said, well, we like the show, but we'd really like to talk to you about the part of it that isn't the performance interruptions. We'd like to talk about the game. So we had conversations for a few years, and then what happened was, you may or may not, you must, you must know, that two years ago, Rocco Landesman made, um, through the NEA, these interesting cross-agency partnerships, including one with HUD, right? Housing and urban. So there was all this money that became available for creative development around sustainability. And the arts community did not know. Artists around the country, for, to a large degree, did not know that that $100 million was available and people didn't know it was out there. But we happened to be in Blacksburg, Virginia, giving a talk at Virginia Tech, which is where I went to grad school. And I gave a much different version of this presentation. I talked about built, and there were planning commissioners in the room. And they came up to me afterwards and said, we have this HUD NEA money. We don't completely know what to do with it. We're having a lot of trouble with the sustainability conversation in our community. And that game seems like it could be interesting. So this was someone approaching us about a need they had. Yes? We didn't have an existing relationship. They approached us. We started a conversation with them. And over a period of eight months, we redesigned the game so that it could be deployed in the five poorest counties in rural Virginia, in southwestern Virginia. And we, we redesigned the objects. We went in and did facilitation training with them, so local people are facilitating it. And it basically now exists as a game that groups of people for the last 10 months have been coming together to be facilitated through. It involves storytelling, it involves gameplay, it involves data gathering, and it is, it is the single primary data gathering tool in a massive public engagement effort that is going to be used to determine how resources are allocated in five counties in Virginia. Because we had, yes, Rebecca.
Yeah. Yeah. You know, transgender. We're doing it. We're, we're in our third community next week. It's something that Elizabeth and Dance Exchange and lots of folks have a lot of experience at as well. But this is what we do now. And this is like a Sojourn and a, and a Center for Performance and Civic Practice project. We have a, there's 13 people in my company. We all sort of lead and specialize in different projects. I'm not the guy at Sojourn that leads this project. Liam leads this, Liam, hi Liam, leads this particular project. And what that means is when people contact us, Liam starts to determine what's going on with them and how we can start sort of collaborative design meetings over the phone, online, and going and doing visits. And then we go, we create a specialized facilitation handbook, we go and do a training, and we basically are sort of working as co-makers with communities on specific versions of this structure or mechanism that can be useful in their locality. So we're really committed to making structures that are replicable. And there's a couple of reasons. One, I'm watching and really believe this is a powerful tool, you know, that we have sort of accidentally sidestepped into that's being really useful in non-art settings. It is also a way of our organization sustaining itself because every time we work on a project, our company and our artists get paid for their work. Our designer is constantly redesigning and modifying this. So it is a civic practice project that has arisen out of a need, but is really sort of serving all involved. It's a great question. I, 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 Elizabeth could take like an hour and talk really in detail about how she's involved in a lot of projects like this. Um, so maybe we'll do a shared convening about that and talk about that. But it's a great question. It's the question. You know? Catholic Charities USA uh, approached us because they saw us at a conference. And um, yesterday, we completed, let's see, what's the short way into this? Oh, actually, I didn't actually read that. Needs, dialogue and civic application, right? Assets we bring to the table, problem solving, bringing people together, building collective vision. Just to sort of really state those things clearly. Catholic Charities, needs, advocacy, story sharing, artist assets, assets, synthesis of complex material, community building, dramaturgy could certainly be up there. Catholic Charities USA uh, connected with us. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that organization. I was not really but they do amazing poverty reduction work all over the world. They have agencies all over the United States, urban and rural communities, and particularly in the last few years, they are really challenged by people basically wrapping Catholic church issues on top of their mission and their narrative when they hear their name. So they have been trying to figure out how to make sure they tell the story of what they do that doesn't say, hey, we're not Catholic but does say, hey, we are different than the institution of the Catholic Church, and here's what we do. And part of that has been they're having trouble building. These organizations have been in cities for like 100 years. And suddenly, the relationships they have that allow them to do pretty amazing work around housing and hunger and sustainability with people of all faiths. It's not a proselytizing, mission-based organization. Uh, has gotten harder because people are reluctant to have them in difficult community conversations because they fear they bring the freight of the Catholic issues into the room. So they asked if we would work with them. And so we did a national conference for them. We gave workshops. We interviewed a bunch of people. We created a performance. I gave workshops on collaboration and difficult conversations. And it was really exciting. And they invited us to be artists in residence uh, for a two-year period, which started a couple months ago. So we are now at regional gatherings with them all over the country. Four Sojourn members, not me, were just with them in Iowa, Tennessee, and Kentucky. They went home last night. And we were at these regional gatherings that were 60 or 70 poverty workers who are coming together to work on skills and basically sort of have those things that happen at convenings where you share ideas and hopefully you get a chance to sort of feel supported by people with similar interests and similar needs for skill development. So with them, one of the things we're doing that I think is interesting and surprising, I've heard the term radical generosity and radical hospitality come up here some, which is something that we talk a lot about in our work. Hospitality and generosity and curiosity are, are our main things. But we have been developing some performance-based forms for groups of people to be together in rooms and not have this experience, but have a different kind of convening experience. We were laughing about it yesterday, Laura, and we were saying, we want the conference that's just debates and arguments. 
We just want, like, I want, Anne's not, is Anne here? I wish Anne was here, because I could say what I really want, which is to put her and Roberto on stage and, like, have them argue some, you know? <laughs> and, and, I, and I'd like to get in there, too. But I would really, like, that moment yesterday, when Roberto asked the question and they had that moment, I was like, oh, I want a day of seeing where that goes, you know? Because that's really rich, in addition to the great presentations we're having. Like, you want that. It's really interesting. So how do you safely make that space? So we've been developing this thing called Four Corners, which basically is a, a, a real different variation on an open space approach to how people work together. Um, wish I had a picture of it. But basically, you find out the questions that people in a room want to wrestle with. You set up different spaces in the room. Each is a different question. You have two people start. You have a really skilled facilitator artist at each corner. And then people jump in and out of a pair of chairs and talk with each other. And then at a certain point can start to go from corner to corner. And then the whole group comes together and figures out what the threads are and tries to deepen it. And then they go back to the corners. And then there's a moment of expression that the performers help with at the end. And it's really dynamic. And apparently, in Iowa, Tennessee, and Kentucky this past week, the Sojourn artists, we'd, we'd set up all these prompts in collaboration with our partners. And the one that was the most delicate, that we were told would be the most delicate, was how do you deal with issues of Catholic identity in your communities and internally. And all the staff at Catholic Charities, the DC staff, the national staff, who are great, were really nervous. And it turned out that that question kind of took over in every place. People wanted to talk about that. And were like weeping, apparently, with the opportunity to talk to their bosses about that publicly and be in conversation. And the artist sort of being a part of making that space and framing that in a, in a constructed way. So I feel like we were able through our assets to help them break through something. And we get over the next couple of years to keep helping have that conversation in different ways. I mentioned the Penelope project before. Yeah? The one at the long-term care facility. Needs, cross-sector innovation, story sharing, artist assets, meaning making, dramaturgy, uh, process, and place which sort of brings us all the way back to this kind of idea of place. This is a nursing home. This is a long-term care facility. It has a mile of corridors. It has different wings. It has people who are able to be functional on their own. It has people who can do nothing on their own. It has staff. It has families in and out all the time. Is there a way that story helps make that place not just more livable, but actually more health-inducing? The tagline for this project, there's a documentary that's been made about it that's about to be released. The tagline is, it be, is beyond bingo, <laughs> which, is, which is not our tagline. That's the tagline some of the healthcare providers came up with. And it, it, it's, it's focused on patient-centered care, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. And the idea is that in long-term care, generally activities are sort of, it's so funny, this word, they're placeholders. Activities are holders for people to do to keep them out of trouble, and so something is happening. But they're not actually engaging in general. So we worked with Ann Basting, an amazing, she's a professor at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, an old friend. She runs the Center on Creativity and Aging. She's awesome. We worked with her for a couple years on this project, and basically together devised an adaptation of the Penelope story within the myth of the Odyssey, and worked on it you know, this is Dorothy. Dorothy is in mid to severe Alzheimer's in terms of her uh, memory functions and her awareness of what's going on. But this is a moment in the show when Odysseus shoots the arrow. Do you know that at the end of the story when he comes home? And so although Dorothy has a lot of trouble holding on to a lot of circumstantial and relational moments, Dorothy held on to this action day after day. And when given the arrow, Dorothy knew where to go with focus and delight across this space, carrying that arrow, landing it in the right place, turning to the audience like this, and just continuing to walk out. So, I mean, and, and you talk to her now. I just saw her at, the, at one of the premieres of the documentary. And I don't know, she... I don't know. It's actually, it's actually weird to talk about without sounding like you're trivializing it. But it's, it's, a very, it's a very powerful experience to work in this kind of setting. Uh, and it was very powerful to sort of see how the arts um, 
work with the health sector to achieve health sector goals that the health sector was having trouble achieving on their own. That's the accomplishment. And again, that's something that other practitioners, you know, Liz and Dance Exchange people and, and Elizabeth, like working on this kind of work for years, we're just trying to be super conscious of identifying this. And we're involved in getting this work out into the national kind of health community. We taught a, an institute in Milwaukee last summer. 60 people came from around the world to learn how to take this kind of project into facilities. China sent a team of people who are responsible for, in the words of the team that showed up, they are responsible for planning for the care of half a billion elderly in the next 10 years. And so they were there to learn strategies that they could take back and replicate on massive scales. That was interesting. And they were great, the folks they signed. It was really interesting. So I want to be aware of time, because I've been going for a while, and you've been super patient. I wanted to ask you to take a moment. I'm not making a phone call. I'm seeing what time it is. OK. So there is sort of one more thing I want to run through on here. But I would love to, to sort of give you a moment to check in with each other. And I think out of these projects I just showed, Penelope, you know, sort of looking at these partnerships, artists in a long-term care facility, artists with a giant social service agency network, artists with urban planners, artists with a developer, working with individuals around the community, working with a rural and urban community on a project, working with public education. There's different kinds of partnerships throughout this. So I'm wondering if you could turn to a partner and share either an example of a partnership from your own experience that you still think about and find interesting, or a partnership you have been thinking about in your future work whether it's social or civic practice, whatever it is, just a partnership that you've been thinking about and are still trying to figure out for yourself how to make that partnership happen. So this could be an opportunity just to chat about that. And if, if what we discover is you guys have been sitting for a long time and you're beyond partner time in this moment, we'll see. Do you feel like a partner moment is OK right now? Yeah. Seem yeah. Okay? OK. So how about just two minutes on that partnership? Go ahead. One minute. Last moments.
you're like, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to go on. I'm ready to go on. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you and go on. Um, I want to know, do you, um, do you want to, do you have thoughts or questions? So here's what's coming up, right? I have these elements to just sort of acknowledge, talk about. I have looking at engagement, participation, and intention with a couple quick examples. I can go through those, and then we could talk and do a couple questions, or like, I could wait, we could talk a little bit, and then I could scroll through those in a few minutes. Do you want to see a little more, or would you like to a ask some questions, talk a little? Where are you at? Yes, sir. And it's certainly reductive for a moment like this, but yeah, but good. But it is reductive. I, I don't know. I, I guess I, I, didn't, I don't see it as reductive. Okay, good. It's, then it's not reductive. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's direct to the point and just feeding like, uh, the language that I assume that people outside of the art field yeah. understand clearly. Like yeah. What is their critique? How are, what specifically do you as an artist bring to it? Yeah. Certainly, out of conversation needs to come a really clear way to articulate needs that the partner can talk about in their context, in their language. So we might come with bullet points, but that's coming out of conversation. Yeah? And then I, I need a way, for instance, these four artists that went on the Catholic Charities trips this past week for Sojourn, like I've been in a lot of the planning meetings with Catholic Charities on the phone and in person, and then I am constantly relaying and in conversation with my company. So if I'm in a four-hour planning meeting, I need to find and develop a shorthand with my collaborators that allows them to be of use and in that conversation when they're on the ground without having to have been in the four-hour conversation. So again, sort of clarity, intention, a process that is very, I feel like the last couple of years we've gotten more and more intentional um, and I, I hope thoughtful and specific about our process so we're able to communicate internally, externally, within our field, and then ex externally with sort of folks who we are partnering with who aren't necessarily language fluent in what we think about as arts language. So yes, we have to find those bullet points, but it is certainly defined collaboratively. Yeah. So this is probably something that maybe in two years we can have a session on it. <laughs> but something that I'm really curious about, and, I'm, and it's probably something that is not to be discussed right now. But that's a lot of qualifying. I am yeah. nervous. <laughs> that is scary. Basically, I'm asking you to take your pants off. And, um, Nobody wants that. <laughs> Yeah. How does your company talk about how you're going to get paid? How how do how does do how does Laura and her staff not only support arts in the community, yeah. but how do you guys make your salaries, make your lives, and how are your people then moving forward and making money in their craft? Sure. So, so we're not talking about that now, but I'm. No, I'll tell you how that. I mean, that's not. A long answer is like in general how that stuff happens, but I can tell you how we work, which is when Catholic Charities approached us, the first conversation, the first set of conversations was, wow, is this a useful partnership on all sides? Do your needs match up with something that we can offer? Okay, what's the scale of that? All right, well, so the scale of that, of what we are talking about together, would cost this. And we are talking about a project that would have to be fee-based because there are other projects we're doing where we are raising money this kind of partnership is not a project we can take on on our own raising money for. This would be a work for hire partnership collaboration. Here's what the scale is. Now the scale could be here, which involves more of us, more deeply and over a different period of time. It could be here. And we basically talked about what are the core goals, what needs to happen for it to have integrity on our part and their part. And then we found a middle place. There was certainly one version of the proposal that was beyond financially what was possible for them. But there was also a version that was not interesting enough to be worth the investment.
I, I think you're asking great questions. I think there's two in here. I should say, nobody at Sojourn is on full-time employment, okay. right? So everybody, including myself, everybody, so I teach at Northwestern. So my, my salary comes from my teaching job, and I'm artistic director of Sojourn Theater, and I get paid when I'm out working for that work. I don't get paid to lead the company. Artists in my company get paid if they are developing work, if they are on the road working, if they are in a room doing work, or in a fair way when they are doing prep work or their own work, they get paid for that. But nobody gets paid daily just for being a member. We have one half-time managing director who's on salary. Everything else is project-based. That said, we actually, um, from the beginning, have said we would like to pay artists more than decently. So we have always looked at the union rate for actors, for instance, and said we will always pay better than that. When we are on the road or when we are at home, we will always pay better than that. Uh, so we have sort of just a, an amount. And then if people are away from home for a certain amount of time, it goes up if you're away from home. There's the things like your per diem, your lodging, all those things. We have certainly worked as company members have had families. We have sometimes wrapped childcare. Uh, if they're going to be gone, what that impact is on their family. When we can, we build that into a project budget. If someone's bringing a child with them, we try to deal with that and, and be a part of that conversation. So the short answer to the first part of your question, how does somebody ask for the $3,000 for their monthly thing? People feel shy about that. Um, you, we have to be comfortable talking about our worth in relation to um, currency, dollars, the economy. But I think that if one is clear about the value of what one does separate from money, and one is clear about one's intention and purpose, then one can talk about the way you sustain yourself to do that work and what you ask for from partners. You also figure out how to scale what you need in relation to you know, some partners, we're gonna scale a budget differently than others based on where they're at and where their funding is coming from and how it supports us. I'm in fully agreement. So, yeah. but yeah, Tanika? Sure, sure. When I started Hope is Vital in 1991, in 1992 or maybe early 93, um, I like to say, because uh, no internet, no cell phones. So those of you coming out of school, first of all, I want to say, like, If you, anytime I hear someone come out of school and like, this is not, this is, I'll get to, it's a great question, but like, man, don't complain. <laughs> because you can access, you can find, literally just finding what is out there, you can do in this room while I'm talking and I won't even know it. <laughs> you can pull a thing out of your pocket and call someone in Hawaii and you won't go into debt. I spent two years as I was building that work, I went into credit card debt purely on Sprint payphone cards. If anyone remembers those. Sprint payphone cards where you would get up you'd, and then it would go to your, you'd pay it every month. I went into deep credit card debt in building, trying to build relationships around the country because I would be at payphones. I'd be in Albuquerque, New Mexico working, trying to get a gig going in Louisiana, I'd be on the phone, it would be an hour and a half at a pay phone after I'd just done an eight hour session, you're on the pay phone, then you gotta get back on later in the night because you gotta go to the west coast and talk to somebody who's in San Jose, and it's just ringing up the debt. So sorry, that was grandpa story time, I apologize. <laughs> so anyway, what I would say is, uh, there's two important roles that you're looking for when you're building partnerships. There's the gatekeeper and there's the ally. You gotta find the gatekeeper, who's the person who's gonna get you, give you access to the room. The ally is the person who's gonna invest in what you're doing and help you build a relationship. So I would suggest that I was focused early on too much on the gatekeeper it, because I would just, I wanted to get in and it took me a while to realize that without the ally, getting in isn't really worth that much. So I used this example yesterday, the vice principal might 
get you into the school, but if there's not the history teacher who's interested in what you're doing, it doesn't matter how passionate the vice principal is about what you're doing because all they did was get you in the building. They didn't actually make, they're not gonna help you have the action and build investment. So gatekeeper and ally, persistence, clarity about who you are, and frankly, entering the potential relationship without a lot of need. Entering the potential relationship leading from curiosity and passion more than need. Because most people you're gonna partner with are dealing with tons of need that they have every day just to keep their things going. If you are coming from need, you're gonna to have to be 100 times more compelling as to why I should take your need on top of my need rather than your curiosity and passion in relation to possibly meeting a need of mine or at least being worth my time. That doesn't mean you can't have needs, but it's the difference again. If you, if you are approaching the project, unable to accomplish the project without someone, you have to be honest about that, but that's not the ideal way to build a partnership. But it's a necessary way sometimes to build a partnership. But you ideally are sort of leaning into relationship and then seeing what happens. Uh, if it's a social practice project, yes, which means you better have done your homework if you're going to say to someone this is what's in it for you. Because right. it's pretty hard to say what's in it for you if I don't know you. Yeah. Oh. You know, so what do I have to know about you to say what's in it for you? But yes, talking about your assets and what, yes. I feel like that was slightly scattered, but I, I got lost in the payphone thing. But. Okay, gatekeeper and ally is the takeaway from that. Yes, yeah. So in terms of gatekeeper and ally, yeah. the civic practice process, yeah. Oh, what a great question. Um, our experience has been uh, starting conversations with gatekeepers and moving through that relationship to an ally. Because if you build the project with a gatekeeper and if you conceptualize and propose without having an ally in that conversation, it's not going to really be ground workable. You know, a lot, I'm sure, I've had terrible, you've probably had terrible experiences with like somebody in a power position in a place and you come up with these ideas and then the people who actually make the work happen not only aren't interested but actually tell you that those ideas will not work. He or she thinks they might work but that's not actually what happens here. Yeah, if you're particularly if you're looking at civic practice, and, and again, not to like, certainly we have done and will continue to do projects where we're like, I have a project idea. I have to find the partners who are going to be interested in relationships around this. But, but yes to what you said in, in terms of you're that. You're doing that so well. We're trying to do that. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so you talk a lot of these amazing, huge deals on it. What about small ones? Yeah. yeah because I find that yeah. that's The micro projects. Yeah, and I want yeah. them to have real tangible successes yeah. at the end. So can you talk a little bit about how you do that? Yeah, let's look at this. Yeah, absolutely. So let's look at some engagement strategies, not as examples of projects, but as different tactics. And, and again, I think what Laura talked about yesterday with Springboard's program, irrigation artists, these little individual projects, it's very similar to what we're trying to do with the Catalyst Initiative at the center and support artists for projects that take 50 hours within a three month span from conceptualizing through manifestation. And that we can both mentor and also document those kind of projects. Because Sarah, you, you are the reason, honestly, that this kind of work needs to be cataloged in terms of models and tactics. Because you are doing amazing work and you want to expand your vocabulary and you want things to show partners. So you need models and strategies. And, and that's why I think a lot of us are like trying to make that public. So who, when, and where, different ways to think about engagement. For instance, on Witness Our Schools. Interviewees were community partners. 
uh, the relationship with the audience and who came to it was based on issues. The leaders were artists and legislators. So thinking about like a micro project, for instance, you just talked about research, right? Some of the early work that we did on this project was literally finding five or 10 people to interview in a rural coastal community. And then in a coffee shop in that community, sharing little bits of those interviews in performative contexts. And that was like, we're there for three days, we interview 15 or 20 people, and on the third night, with a partner we had at a coffee shop, we read some things that have been quickly composed off of those texts. And it's a way for people to feel the move from research into some kind of moment of expression, and it's a moment for sort of some shared stakeholding in it. Um, I'm gonna look at another one, the where. When we think about, oh, the when. When we think about engagement, when does it happen? During development, during production, during post-production activity. So it's hard to talk to people about like a, a year and a half long project if you're starting. But is there a way that you sort of look at development, not as something that happens privately and internally, but I guess just like the example I gave a little bit, as sort of small projects that might be building to a larger thing, but that are constantly cycling through learning and sharing, and learning and sharing. So I feel like in a way, irrigation is an interesting example of like 180 different things happening. And Laura's other example yesterday about you are doing this flag project with me, which means you are part of an ongoing flag project, right, at however many conferences. There's that version too, which is I go somewhere and I do a development workshop in a particular community with a group of young people. And although I'm thinking about a larger project over a two-year period, the way I'm building it is modularly and tenderly. I do one two-hour thing with one group, and it, it has... It is its own circle. And then I do this, but there's a relationship between these two. And then I do this. And both how I talk about it in terms of scale, but also are there strategies to connect, like what came out of this into this one, into this one. I don't know if our flags move on to the next one or pictures of our flags or something. Who knows? We don't know. Where, site-based, non-traditional venues, associative values. I hear a lot of talk about this having just been here for a few days, but it seems like there's a lot of interest in site-based work, in non-traditional venues, locations, and spaces. And I think this is a really potent way to work on small scales. How do you, um, how do you kind of invest a site that is not necessarily known as a space for art or expression with bursts of that? that allow you to kind of demonstrate presence um, and temporary transient impact. So I think about like youth workshops that might happen with small groups and what if every, every couple months three have happened and then what comes out of that is your ensemble makes a small 10 minute piece that happens in a public place near each of those youth centers or schools. So again, the research is moving forward, but it's also moving through these manifestation moments. You know? I'm gonna I'm gonna hold there for a moment and see. That's just some thoughts on that, but I want to keep thinking about that. I want to know if there's other questions because we are bumping against time. Yeah, Tim. Yeah. Total mix. Mix depending on the project, depending on the location. We've definitely worked with some corporate sponsors, with government money, private foundation money, yeah. Is one easier or harder to get for you? Or really? really depends on the project. For the Penelope project, the one in the long term care facility, that has, we're now doing another project in Milwaukee with homebound seniors, look, working with public transit and the health department and, and caregivers and homebound seniors. And because of the Penelope Project's kind of impact, the health sector is, is really showing up at the table with funding because they feel like there's a bit of a, of a history we've proven with that partnership. So, yeah, yeah. Other? Linda, how am I doing on time in terms of your sense? Are we okay? Okay. How are you guys doing? You want me to do a little more of this? Or you got, I'm super kind. It's a long time for you to sit there and, and listen to me and be in these seats. So, you doing all right? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Questions? Okay. I'll just show another one of these. 
Okay. This idea of participation, looking at different strategies, built. This is a question that I think is, is important when people talk about participation. What participatory activity within the work impacts the event itself? So I think that there's participation in theater that, and then in lots of events, that feels kind of um, decorative or um, surrounding the pre-show display, the, the thing that you do something during the show and you take that with you. And these things are, are good and, and really interesting. But then there's also participation that actually impacts what happens in the show, making you a co-maker in some way. And I just want to kind of note the distinction when we think about participation. Built being an example in terms of the game nature of it. We're doing this show right now in Chicago called How to End Poverty in 90 Minutes with 199 People You May or May Not Know. Um, and it's a devised participatory show. And the deal is that we take $1,000 from the box office, each performance, and it gets dumped on stage in a big glass globe that goes up in the air and the money blows around like lottery balls. And the audience has 90 minutes with us to decide how to spend the $1,000 to attack poverty in the Chicagoland area. And at the end of the show, the money will be spent. And the deal is that our job is both to contextualize conversations about poverty in complex and challenging ways, but also to move the audience through a collective decision-making process, through facilitation and dialogues. There's a lot of live media in the show with community members having cameos where they get to speak about the issues on screen. So that is an example for us where participation is actually impacting the event because the audience's decision making will impact how the show ends and where the money goes. There isn't a traditional story in the show. The plot of the story is the audience's decision and how they make it. So for us. How? This is the international Skype chorus in the race. So that's Dublin. And this is a moment where that person in Dublin this is, I think, the night before the election. I guess we did weird shows. I mean, this was a Monday night. So this is the night before. And this person in Dublin was basically asking the audience in this moment who they thought was going to win the election the next day. And so the audience is raising their hands based on who they think is going to win. And then he asked them uh, a question about what Americans thought we uniquely felt about leadership that might be different than other countries and different audience members could answer via live feed to him and be Skyped to him. So this was a, a particular like four minute section of the show with conversation. So again, this is a how strategy in terms of participation. Intention, why? And this gets me back to built. And this thing that we sort of started about a little bit at the beginning, just thinking about this idea of, um, of place and the, and the sort of why. And Anne, we talked about this with Anne a little bit last night, but um, if we are seeking to make place, to engage, to work with partners, to not just be in the studio working on our own, what are our reasons? Like, why are we doing that? You know, in different instances. And our why's change all the time. But why are we doing it? Are we doing it so the community we live in will be better for us? Are we doing it so it will be better for everyone? Are we doing it so a community we don't have daily experience of will be better for the people who live in it and we want to participate in that? Are we doing it because as artists it feels juicy? Like it's the work that is satisfying to us? What, what are our reasons? And we've had to ask that a lot in relation to built. And it in a way comes down to what you asked Roberto in terms of replicability and what the gentleman over here asked in terms of money because this is becoming a project that could like spin larger to more places as more people are connecting with us about it. And the question becomes, did we develop this particular project to franchise it as a, as a revenue source? Or did we develop it because as artists, we want to be in those rooms, do, having those experiences and doing that work and be paid for that work. And so that is a conversation we are having as a group of artists. And it's pretty clear as a group, we lean towards, well, we developed it because we want to be in those rooms. Like that's, exci that's exciting for us. We are also interested in the tool having an applic having a utility that may be beyond our means, as you were referring to, and how to do that in a way that feels that it has integrity and is still along our intentions. We haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. This is just an active thought. Yeah. Well, one of the distinctions that may is a civic engagement. Civic practice and social practice, yeah. I think in, in 
in a civic practice, practice the utilizing all the stakeholders in the process of imagining their pluralities is much more in the foreground. And in, and in social practices, there may not be about the big plurality of, of, a, of a life together. So that's just something to sort of think about. In this particular sort of uh, exercise, why it might have traction? Because everybody's thinking about the plurality. Yes. And the social imaginary. Right. The social yes. Imaginary. Yes. Absolutely. I appreciate that. That's a great point. Yeah, we are, we are thinking about that, I mean, a lot and always. How is the work we're doing a part of, this gets back to something I said at the beginning about dramaturgy and public process. How are we a part of our communities functioning in more healthy, functional, connective, equitable ways? Right? Like, how are we that as artists? How is that part of our role? That our role is to express, to comment on, to interrogate, and also, you know, f not for every artist, but like for me, I'm interested in my artist peer community of artists who are interested in that. And that means we have to put ourselves in contexts and settings where we do translation, we become more fluent, we become more fluid, and we become clear about why we're there and what we want to accomplish. Yeah? Yes, are we willing to be in discomfort? Yeah, yeah. Um, the last thing I have is a, is a question, but I don't feel like you, I think we're past pair moments right now. So I think I would simply ask, are there any final thoughts or, or questions as we move towards our wrapping? Yes, Lauren. On the table, urban rural, yeah. Um, and I, I think also in terms of translation, it's not just about translating arts practices in our own settings, but I feel very profoundly in this particular state that even the polarity between, uh, for example, progressive and conservative, if there were a way that, and, and I'm sure there is a way, and I'm just haven't quite conceived it yet, but to begin having the conversations between those two polarized It would be what? That the rural and urban. Yeah. Well, we actually explored that urban rural model as a replicable model for communities and festivals. And frankly, we, we, got, we got too busy with other things to deeply invest in getting that out there as a model that we could work on with other places. But we, yeah, I mean, I think the whole two act ones, bridge, come together, meal dialogue is like a super fun model that. I hope we get to work more on. But they could work with your, with your different, the, the yeah. different diverse sound That would be perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a question about beginning. Yeah. Um, you know, you're coming from 13 years in Sojourn, and even here you're able to reflect back on maybe that was a misstep or we might have contextualized things differently. And um, this is, it's tough. And I don't think we have a society right now that is really trying which is what you were saying, Marilyn. And um, it's hard to not feel like you're getting into the weeds. It, it's, a, it's a little immobilizing to try to figure out where and how to begin in an ethical way, um, knowing, of course, that you know I could be in 13 years reflecting back on, oh, wow, that was really quandary, I was saying, you know? Or, so I'm just curious if you have some advice or thoughts on how to, with intention and mindfulness, this is big stuff. And how to, in small ways, get in it, um, grapple with, of course, the missteps that are going to be made, and grapple with some of the really big, scary disagreements, dialogues, things that happen along the way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's so neat for me to sort of share this in relation to Laura's springboard work and what she shared yesterday, because the, the sort of way that they talk about the one day training and then sending people out to find a partner and then check in in the study hall and work on it. it. I must say, like, 
it's in a way from the outside far less rigorous, you know, than a lot of people are comfortable with. And certainly then, I mean, I teach and mentor a lot of artists and stuff and far less rigorous in terms of the time that people spend on that work. And yet there's something great about that model of we start with some one-on-one -on -one and some basic context and the prompt invitation. And it's true, the t-shirt that you're part of something and the connecting with someone. And I think there's somewhere for me in between this getting a sense of where you're starting from and a sense of honesty and groundedness, being a part of a community of practitioners, having some tools, trying a small project, being in conversation through it, being in conversation with peers in response to it, and then doing it again. And seeing what relationship develops or developing new relationships. I mean, that, that's certainly, without having a community, that's certainly how I started Hope is Vital. Um, and, and is how I certainly try to send students and colleagues out into the world now is just, um, you gotta, you gotta have some experiences and you have to be responsible and you need to be in conversation about it, but you can become paralyzed by the fear of um, an ethical misstep. Yeah. And it's like you just gotta kind of do. You gotta do, and you can, you can prep and contextualize doing in smart ways, but, but you, do, you do gotta do. And, and I do think, I often remember that there are many fields and many moments in our daily life where people are doing all kinds of things without prep that go horribly awry, and then many that don't. And like, just being thoughtful about it to begin with puts us in an okay place to try something that probably won't do too much damage in that tiny first step, as long as we're sort of thoughtful. Yeah. 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 It's really nice to, to be here and be in conversation with you all. So thanks so much for having me. Um, we, oh, I, I want to say this. Wait. Uh, oh, I didn't even get to talk about these other projects. That's right. <laughs> the only thing I'll say is we have these summer institutes, right? So we do a three-day institute this summer. We're in D.C. Um, and we're in San Francisco. Uh, and it's all on our website, which is there at the top, sojourntheater.org. And at these institutes, this summer it's a little different. We're doing a three-day devising institute on generating new work. And then we're following that with a three-day institute on civic practice. You can take both. But we've pulled them out a little bit because some people are really coming for the generative approach and some people are really coming for devising and civic practice. And in DC, there's actually a really exciting three-day one on devising and design and media in engaged practice that's being led by two other Sojourn artists. And that one's going to be actually really exciting. So um, this is how to keep track of Sojourn and the cpcp.org. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening for a while. <laughs>